to start off this morning with number 444. I love to tell the story. 444. Let's all stand up as we sing this opening.
At this time, I invite you to come up to the front of the church. We've got a, a special gift to give you. <laughs>
And then that trick where you know you pretend you're getting a penny out of your ear. He says, see, it's okay, now I got it back out. The boys crying immediately turned to sheer joy. And he grabbed the penny from the dad's mouth, stuck it in his mouth, swallowed it again, and said, Daddy, do it again! <laughs> sometimes and frankly it can be hard to just be a man in today's society but I'm convinced that even in the year 2013 our Heavenly Father is looking for men who will stand up to the challenge of being a man of honor in the 21st century and this morning through the pages of Scripture we're going to look at the story of one of my personal favorite dads in the Bible and this man has an additional accolade that no doubt he is the most famous stepdad in all of human history. Anybody have a stab at who I think the most famous stepdad in the Bible is? Looking at Joseph this morning, the stepdad of Jesus Christ. So if you would, please turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. If you're using a pew Bible this morning, the page numbers do reset in the New Testament. You'll actually find this on page 1 of the New Testament. <laughs> Socially 
and materially. So does this mean that Joseph and Mary didn't love each other? No, we don't know. But all it does mean is that typically love was not a factor. If they did love each other, that was a plus. And typically as the marriage progressed, they did fall in love. But a lot of times that took place after the wedding day. And something else that's different is that during this betrothal period, a lot of times the bride and groom didn't <coughs> see each other. Husbands, do you remember how hard it was on the morning of your wedding, whenever, at least if you were keeping with tradition, you weren't supposed to see your bride? That's hard. A lot of times in the first century, the husband wouldn't see his wife for the first year, the whole year before the wedding, during this betrothal period. So one night, at some point in the betrothal period, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told Mary, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be the son of God, and he is going to save the world. And Mary told the angel, how can this be? I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. Joseph and I have saved ourselves for marriage. And yet you say I'm going to be pregnant. And angel Gabriel tells her, this is going to be a child <coughs> conceived by the Holy Ghost. This child will not be produced by natural means, but it will be a virgin birth. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1 that after Mary got up from this angelic encounter, that she packed her bags and she moved out to the country to be with her relative Elizabeth, who at the time was pregnant with the man who had become known as John the Baptist. John the Baptist and Jesus were related. And the Bible doesn't tell us why Mary got out of Nazareth and moved out to a nameless village out in the countryside. But if back then was anything like today, I have a feeling that she might not have wanted to deal with the scandal of being pregnant outside of marriage. Because friends, people's first assumption about Mary was not going to be a virgin birth, was it? It was going to be that she committed adultery. And while adultery is serious today, Back then, it could mean getting stoned. Back then, it would at least mean your family's name was ruined. So Mary got out of Nazareth and went and spent some time with her cousin Elizabeth. And because Mary and Joseph didn't even see this, didn't even see each other this year, I don't even think that Mary told Joseph what had happened. Because later on, we read how when Joseph finds out, he doesn't even assume it's a virgin birth. So I don't think he found out from Mary. You know how I think Joseph found out? Well before Facebook and telephones, people have been finding ways to gossip, haven't they? I think if, as Mary was out there in this nameless village, I think somebody saw her, and somebody saw that she was starting to get a little bit of a tummy on her. And I think that this somebody probably knew somebody that lived in Nazareth. You know, I'm convinced that gossips have been one of the driving force of innovations in communication technology. I can just almost imagine <laughs> the first passenger pigeon that carried a message, when it arrived, they unwrapped that scroll and said, you will not believe what Bertha was wearing at the market this morning. <laughs> I think that word traveled fast that Mary looked like she was pregnant. And so I don't think that Mary told Joseph. I think that gossip started going around, and all of a sudden Joseph hears word that his fiance is pregnant. And a lot of commentators give Joseph a hard time because Joseph's first assumption was not that Mary had been impregnated supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. But give him a break. Guys, if your fiance turned up pregnant and you've been saving yourself for marriage, is your first assumption going to be the virgin birth? Absolutely not. So Joseph here is contemplating what to do, and he's made the decision, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, he's made the decision to not shame her in public, but he's made the decision to, to take care of this quietly so that she can keep some semblance of reputation. But while he's considering this, an angel of the Lord comes to him, tells him, Joseph, Mary has not been unfaithful to you. This child is of God. This child will be the Savior who comes to save his people. You will name him Jesus. And the name Jesus literally means God <laughs> saves. For he will save his people from their sins. And then the Bible says that Joseph got up and did what the angel said. 
You see, while well, I know that Jesus is at the center of the Christmas story, I think we've got a lot to learn from this man, Joseph. Men, this morning, if you want to be a man that God can use, I have, th I have four simple principles for you, four simple character traits that Joseph exhibits here. Wives, if you want your husbands to be men that God can use, I pray that you will encourage them in these four areas. These are four things, reflect on the back of your bulletin. We're going to move quick. These are four things that I believe that Joseph exhibits that we can learn well from. Number one, if we want to be a man that God can use, then we need to be a pursuer of purity. Guys, I think it is so cool that verse 18 tells us. Look what verse 18 says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I don't think you need me to explain what it means when the Bible says before they came together, but the Bible here is telling us that Mary and Joseph had not had sex. They were virgins. And so Joseph here, because he had been a pursuer of purity... He knew that there was no way this baby was his. That's the one fact he knew. It couldn't be his. And guys, imagine how radically different the Christmas story would be if Mary didn't know who the daddy of her baby is. Imagine how different scripture would have played out if they had not pursued purity. And I think in the year 2013, more than at any point in our past, this is a desperate need for men who claim to follow Jesus Christ. I recently did some research on statistics of the number of men that are using pornography on a regular basis. I discovered that more than 65% of men admit to using pornography at least once a week. If you back that off to at least once a month, that number jumps to 85%. And guys, this is just people who are admitting it. How many are not admitted? 85%. And why do I bring this up? Because we're in church. Surely that's people out there, right? But not in here. My friends, they discovered that even among evangelical Christians, more than 60% of men look at porn on a regular basis. In our day, it is more easily accessible than ever. They used, to, they used to say that money was the number one cause of divorce in America. Guess what's catching up to it really, really quick? Guys, it seems like on a weekly basis, we hear about another man or woman of God that is involved in a horrible scandal on the front page of the newspaper. We as men have got to take a stand and say that by the grace of Jesus Christ, it will not be us. I don't care if it gets to 99% of people who say it's going to be okay. Are you willing to be in the 1% who says, not I, Lord? God, help us to be pursuers of purity. But what have you said, Brother Josh? And sexual sin is in my past and probably is for about everyone here. So what about that? What about if sexual sin has been our past? What if we don't have that purity that we want to have? Guys, can I tell you the one word that makes Christianity different from every other religion on the face of the planet? It is grace. And God's grace is for you this morning. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1 9 says, If you confess your sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you would say with me, Brother Josh, I don't have that purity that I wish I had. Friends, brothers, sisters, let's start today. Let us be men and women that God can use and let us not disqualify ourselves <coughs> by looking at junk, by lusting after other women. Let us not disqualify ourselves. Let us be a pursuer of purity. 
And as we realize the amazing grace that we have received through Christ Jesus, let us also, number two, let us be givers of grace. I mentioned earlier that Joseph basically had three options when he was deciding what to do with Mary. Deuteronomy 22, verse 23 says that if a virgin who is engaged to a man is caught in adultery, you know what the crime was? Or do you know what the punishment was? They stoned her. That was a death penalty. Adultery is serious business. Now, in the first century, that probably wasn't too much of an option because the Roman Empire, they didn't care much about whether or not people committed adultery. And the Roman Empire wasn't going to allow the Jews to abide by that Old Testament law of stoning for adultery. But what was Joseph's option? is he could have publicly shamed her. He could have made a big deal in the synagogue about how I was engaged to this woman and now she's pregnant and is not mine. This woman is a harlot. Be away with her. Joseph then would have had that ridicule on his shoulders. And not only that, he probably would have gotten some, uh, some brownie points with the Pharisees because he'd be so zealous for the law. But instead, Joseph chose the third option. Joseph didn't feel like he could go through with the marriage for all he knew, his, his fiance was pregnant with another man's child. But he did decide to take care of it quietly so that Mary and that little baby could maybe have a life for themselves. You see, I believe that with the little information that Joseph heard, probably through gossip, I think he made a selfless, loving decision to try to spare Mary from the ridicule that was surely coming her way. Men, I know a lot of times we associate masculinity with gruffness and insensitivity. But can I tell you something? Jesus Christ could probably out-arm wrestle any one of us here. And he was a man of grace and a man of kindness. Let us who call ourselves men be givers of grace. Let us forgive those who have wronged us. Let us be quick to believe the best in people. Slow to believe the worst of people. Let us be givers of grace. Number three, let us be disregarders of DNA. Whenever the angel came to Joseph, the angel said to him in verse 21, She shall bear a son, not your son, but she shall bear a son, and you <coughs> shall call him Jesus. You see, in Hebrew society, on the eighth day, they'd take in a baby boy for circumcision. That's whenever they would name the boy. And guess whose job it was to name the baby boy? The father. The daddy. And the angel tells Joseph, she's going to have a son. But you're going to name him Jesus. See, the angel wasn't just saying, this is what you're going to name him. The angel was saying, this is going to be your boy that you're going to by a show of hands, raise your hand this morning. If you have, if, if you are a father figure to someone in your life besides someone who is your biological child, by a show of hands, anybody in that position this morning? God, let's, let's give a round of applause to these guys. I'm sure that you can attest that your position is not always easy, is it? But as men, we are called to be a disregarder of DNA. If God has put a child in your life to be a father figure to them, it doesn't matter whether or not you share the same genes. I pray that you will take care of that little kid to the best of your ability. You will change their life. Most of you know by now that my little sister Dottie was adopted. And not too long ago, we were sitting around the kitchen table and we were talking about adoption. And she was talking about how she wishes that her birth parents loved her. They didn't. They just didn't love her. And that broke her heart. It breaks my heart. I told her, I said, Dad, I said, Dottie, Mom and Dad loved me out of obligation. That's kind of just what they were supposed to do. They chose you. They saw the millions of children in this country that needed parents, and they chose you. My parents modeled for me what it means to be a disregarder of DNA. And if you are a dad here this morning, it doesn't matter whether or not your kids in your life look like you. If God's put them in your life, 
I pray you'll be there for them. I pray that you will raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Let us be disregarders of DNA. And fourth and finally this morning, I challenge that those of us who are men, that we need to be counters of the cost. Verse 24 tells us, look what verse 24 says. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded. You know, think about the two choices that stood before Joseph. Joseph could A, throw Mary under the bus, or B, marry her and share the reproach that was on her. Because guys, like I said earlier, people were not assuming it was virgin birth. No one believed that except for Mary and Joseph and Elizabeth and the family associated. And so whenever Joseph made the decision... To marry Mary. What do you think people were assuming about him? They were assuming that he had committed adultery too. So see, what was just Mary's reproach became something that Joseph lived with till the day he died. The reason I can say that with certainty is that in all the Gospels later on in Jesus' life, it never talks about Joseph. As a matter of fact, the implication given is that at some point... In Jesus' life, Joseph actually passes away. And what we know about Jesus' life is that in John 8.41, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees. And the Pharisees said, who are you to teach us? You are a child born of fornication. Jesus was over 30 years old at that point, And that had followed him his entire life. So Joseph here had a huge decision that stood in front of him. Was he going to be a man of honor? Or is he going to take the easy way out and avoid this public pain? But verse 24 tells us that when he awoke, he got up and did what the angel said, told him to. It's so cool because in Matthew chapter 1 and 2, there are four different times where angels come to Joseph in a dream. And after every one of those four times, the very next sentence in Scripture says, And Joseph got up and did what the angel said. Joseph knew what it would mean for him, this man with a, a pedigree. Joseph was in the line of kings. King David was his ancestor. King Solomon, King Rehoboam, King Asa, King Jehoshaphat. All these guys were his great, 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 great grandpas. He had a name to protect. But in obedience to God, he was willing to say, that is not important. What is important is that I raise this baby that this angel said is one day going to die and take away my sins. He counted the cost, and he made the decision to be obedient to God. Jesus one time told a parable of a man who was building a house. And instead of checking his bank account, he decided that he was just going to build this big old house. And he laid the foundation, and he started building the building. And guess what happened? He ran out of money. The Bible says that he became the laughing stock of his community because he was the man that had the half-finished house. Have you ever seen those, like back in 2007, 2008, when the housing bubble burst? All those half-finished condo buildings and just, just developments that are just uh, ghost towns of unfinished houses. It was kind of like that. He did not count the cost. And he did not have enough to complete the mission. Jesus tells us that if we want to be his disciples, if we want to say that we're going to obey Him, we need to count the cost and determine if we're willing to do it or not. Because being a Christian is not a 50% job, is it? It is something that requires all of us. And I want you to realize what Joseph was giving up when he made the decision to take Mary as his wife. But I also want you to realize is that after he counted the cost, he woke from his sleep. And he got up and he did what the angel of the Lord told him to do. And ladies, I hope you don't feel like you've gotten off easy this morning. Because while I have been addressing the men on Father's Day, I hope you realize that basically every element of this sermon applies to you equally. <laughs> ladies, men, what is God asking you to do? What hard thing is he challenging you with right now? 
Maybe he's convicting you about the need to read scripture more diligently. Maybe it's time for you to go from a once a week Bible reader to reading every day. <laughs> Maybe God's been convicting you that 30 seconds a day of prayer is simply not enough anymore. Maybe God's convicting you this time to support the ministry with your finances. Maybe God is convicting you. I don't even know why I'm about to say this. Maybe God is convicting you because God's not on my heart. Maybe there's someone here that's supposed to be a preacher. Maybe there's someone here that God's called to be a missionary. Maybe there's someone here that God is calling into the ministry, whether it be full-time or part-time. If God asks you to do something, after you've counted the cost, I pray that you will be like Joseph and will get up and do as God has commanded you. Do you think it was easy whenever Joseph made the decision to be the daddy of Jesus, to be the father figure, the stepdad in his life? I bet it's a pretty difficult job. But he got up and did it because his God asked him to. If we want to be a man that God can use today, a woman that God can use, we must do the same thing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I am so thankful for how applicable your word is in our lives today. And Lord, I pray that, that each person here, Lord, will have something from your scripture to take home with them this morning. Lord, I pray that your name is honored and glorified. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to do the hard things. Lord, I pray that when you do challenge us, Lord, no matter how hard it is, Lord, no matter how crazy it may seem to me at the time, Lord, I pray that we will be obedient to you. I pray, Lord, that we will be men and women that you can use. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you say with me, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Yeah.